just for kids and friendly little airplanes. The world of JJ the jet plane and his flying friends. And old Oscar leads the parade. You'll find out how JJ gets his blue color. Then take a front row seat for Tracy's thrilling race. She's got a shot at the record. And you'll also attend Snuffy's birthday party. And watch old Oscar in a grand airport. In Tracy's handy hideout, you'll meet Lucky. They call me Lucky. And get a close-up look at the famous Sparkleberry tree. I'd love to fly with a snowman. Fly high in the sky with a snowman and snuffy. Discover Tracy's favorite hiding place. And zoom down the mountain with her, the ski king of Frosty Pine. Oh. Now you can join JJ's fan club. Members receive a cotton t-shirt with JJ's picture on the front and an Easy Airlines pilot's license with your name on it. Join in the fun. Collect all the JJ videos. You'll be giving your child sweet dreams, wholesome lessons, and precious memories that will last Lifetime. Way down in Terry Town, there's a special way to get around. It's the only way I've ever found to play above the ground. of the morning. JJ was wide awake. He was too excited to sleep. In only a few hours at daybreak, the little jet would take his very first flight. All the other planes in the hangar were sound asleep, except for one, Big Jake, the biggest, toughest looking plane in the fleet. Big Jake opened one huge eye and stared right at JJ. His piercing gaze made the little jet shudder. JJ nervously introduced himself. Hello, my name is JJ. But Big Jake said nothing. He just stared. Uh, you know what? Said JJ. Today will be my very first flight. Big Jake looked unimpressed. You'll see, I'm going to fly faster and higher and better than any plane that ever flew. <laughs> Big Jake studied JJ's eager face and said, Better get some rest, kid. You're going to need it. Then... Shutting his enormous eye, Big Jake thought about his first flight many, many years ago. The summer sun awoke with a wide orange yawn over Terrytown Valley. JJ was yawning too. Although he hadn't slept a wink, he was excited and ready to fly. Easy O'Malley, head of the airline, gave JJ a pep talk. Welcome to Easy Airlines, kid. You're gonna do fine. Just fine. JJ was so excited, he didn't hear a single word. All he could think about was impressing everyone with a dazzling display of flying. All we want is a quick spin around the valley, Easy O'Malley continued. And remember, follow your flight plan. That's rule number one around here. Now, if you have any questions, I'll... Vroom, zoom! Before Easy and Molly could finish, JJ took off as fast as he could. He sped away so fast, it blew the cap off Easy O'Malley's head. Whoa! 
KG pointed his nose straight up to the sky. He raced up, up, up through the clouds. Whoa, hang on there, wait, the surprise pilot yelled. JJ wasn't about to wait. He reached the top of his climb, did a double backward somersault, and then dove straight down. JJ was very pleased with himself. <laughs> I bet they never saw anything like that before. <laughs> the little jet sped across Lightning Bug Lake, just barely above the water. When he reached the Terrytown Dairy, he swooped low across the pasture, startling the grazing cows. Whoa. Entering the forest of the whistling pines, he rolled onto his back and raced upside down along the treetops. Hold on, the pilot shouted. That's not your flight plan. But JJ didn't care. He was having too much fun. He soared and flipped and looped and spun. He even flew two circles around the peak of Big Nose Mountain. That's enough of that, snapped the angry pilot, finally taking control of the little jet. Yes, that is enough, thought JJ, who suddenly felt very, very tired. JJ saw a large crowd gathering as he taxied toward the hangar. He felt quite proud of himself. Surely everyone was impressed with my flying, he thought. But why aren't they cheering? As JJ got closer, he realized something was dreadfully wrong. Uh-oh, I think they're unhappy with me. Easy O'Malley looked sternly at J.J. What you did was very dangerous, he said. I was just trying to make you proud of me, J.J. explained. We'll be proud of you when you show us you can follow the rules. J.J. thought about rule number one. Always follow your flight plan. And he realized he had made a big mistake. The embarrassed little chip rolled toward the hangar. He was sorry he broke the rules. He looked up, and there was Big Jake wearing an icy scowl. Poor J.J. felt all alone. As Big Jake watched J.J., he remembered the reckless days of his youth, and the memories made him smile. J.J. looked up and saw that Big Jake's expression had changed. Now he was looking into a kind, loving, sympathetic face. Was that a tear he saw in Big Jake's eye? Hey, kid. Everybody makes mistakes, Big Jake said. That's how you learn what not to do. Let me tell you about the mistakes I made on my first flight. <laughs> Savannah, 
Welcome home, my dear. Thanks, Easy. You're still sweet as sugar cane, she said. You've made me feel right at home. All of you have. Then, because she was tired after her long trip, she made her way to the hangar to relax for a while. Easy O'Malley posted a Do Not Disturb sign outside the hangar so that Savannah could rest in peace. But Tracy had to talk with her right away. She peeked into the hangar and said timidly, Excuse me, Miss Savannah, may I talk with you for a moment, please? Savannah gave Tracy a warm smile. Sure, honey, what's on your mind? Tracy hurried into the hangar. She had so much she wanted to say, it all came out at once. I never get to do anything fun. I never get to go to interesting places. All I do is study, 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 train, 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 practice, practice, practice. It's so boring. But you, you go to exciting places all the time. It must be wonderful. You're wonderful. And I want to be just like you. But I don't know how. And I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. Savannah looked at Tracy with calm, reassuring eyes. One day, when you're older, you'll go to all the places I've been, and then some. But you know what? I bet things wouldn't seem so boring right now if you learned to use your imagination a little more. Uh, what do you mean? asked Tracy. Well, when I was your age, living in this very hangar, I used to dream about the big, wide world outside and all the faraway places I wanted to see. And guess what? In my dreams, I could go there. What good is that? asked Tracy. It's not real. It's just a dream. Tracy, don't you see? You have to have dreams. If you don't dream dreams, you have nothing to reach for. You have no dreams to come true. Later that night, before falling asleep, Tracy thought about everything Savannah had said. She stayed up very, very late, thinking and thinking and thinking. The morning was unusually hazy as Tracy set out on her training flight. Climbing high over the mountains, she thought she saw Savannah way in the distance, disappearing into a dense patch of clouds. Racing to the spot where Savannah had been, she came upon a tunnel through the clouds. But entering the tunnel, Savannah was nowhere in sight. Tracy called out, Savannah! But her own echo is all that came back. A bluish white light twinkled at the far end of the tunnel. She hurried forward and at long last reached the end. Emerging into the light, she could not believe her eyes. Through wispy clouds, a shimmering city of glass loomed on the horizon. Everything sparkled and glistened like diamonds. It was the most breathtaking thing Tracy had ever seen. In the distant haze, she thought she saw Savannah. But before she could call to her, a glint of sunlight flashed in her eyes. The next thing she knew, she was gliding over a boundless field of golden sunflowers that reached from the ground all the way to the sky. White puffy clouds rolled in over the giant flowers, but these were no ordinary clouds. They were shaped like tiny tugboats, and each carried a smiling yellow duckling. Like an armada on parade, they floated by in perfect formation. Tracy was delighted, but quite confused. She shut her eyes, and when she opened them, she was flying under a rainbow. Well, not just a rainbow, but thousands of rainbows lined up one after the other, forming an immense, endless archway. Tracy looked down and was surprised to see that she was flying over a silvery sea. What happened next was even more amazing. A big blue dolphin leaped out of the ocean, hung in the air, smiled at Tracy as she flew past, then dove back into the water with a stupendous splash. Just then, a shadow streaked across the water. 
When Tracy looked up to see what it was, she thought she saw Savannah racing toward the distant snow-capped mountains. But when she reached the towering white peaks, there was no sign of Savannah, only a family of enormous snowmen who smiled and waved to her through the foggy mountain air. Suddenly, the fog thickened around her, and in the next instant, she was back inside the cloud tunnel. Before long, she emerged into the hazy daylight, and there, just ahead, was Savannah. Tracy followed her back over the mountains and across the valley until at last they arrived safely home. What happened? Where were we? How did we get there? Tracy said with a start. Not we, Tracy. You. You were dreaming. Savannah's voice was soft, almost a whisper. Dreaming? What dream? Tracy was confused. The dream that came out of your imagination, Savannah said. And I think now you know that dreaming is the first step to getting wherever you want to go. But I can't get there without you. Sure you can, Tracy. You already have. I didn't take you anywhere. I just pointed the way. You mean I went by myself? Tracy's eyes lit up with dawning awareness. Oh, Savannah, it was so beautiful. There was a big blue dolphin and giant sunflowers and a city made of glass. And, and you know what? You were in my dream too. I'll tell you a secret, Savannah said softly. While you've been dreaming of faraway places, I've been dreaming of home right here in Tarrytown. And guess what? You were in my dream, too. Jake had been in the air less than five minutes when he heard a strange whirring noise and then felt an unpleasant throbbing in his right wing. A moment later, the pilot gave him the bad news. Better head back, Jake. Don't like the sound of that number two engine. Back on the ground, Big Jake was examined by the airline's best mechanic, Brenda Blue. I can have him back in the air in about two hours, she told E.C. O'Malley. Problem is, Brenda, we don't have two hours. Big Jake was running a spare part up to Mountain View. Gotta be there in 45 minutes or our goose is cooked. Brenda Blue saw that the situation was desperate. Easy O'Malley needed a backup for Big Jake right away. There is one plane left, she said, but he's never flown at night. It's JJ. A few minutes later, J.J. found himself at the head of the runway amid a flurry of activity. As Brenda Blue checked him over, the little jet was tanked with fuel and the vital spare part was transferred from Big Jake. J.J. whispered something, but Big Jake couldn't make it out. What's that you said, J.J.? I said, I can't go, J.J. whispered. I'm afraid of the dark. But J.J., Everyone's counting on you, Big Jake whispered back. I've never flown at night. What if I get lost? What if I bump into something out there in the dark? Big Jake could see that the little jet was very distressed. J.J., listen to me, he said in a soft, reassuring voice. Before I first flew at night, I felt the same way you feel. But after I did it once, I learned I could do it. And believe me, you can do it too. Do you really think so? I know so. You're a good flyer, JJ. And one day you'll be a great one. I'll tell you what. You make this run, and I'll let you fly a stunt with me at the air show next month. You'll fly a stunt with me? JJ couldn't believe his ears. Do you mean it? Do you really think I'm that good a flyer? You bet I do, said Big Jake, and he meant it too. 
All clear for takeoff. JJ was so thrilled by Big Jake's vote of confidence, he climbed into the night sky, forgetting all about his fears. The little jet gazed down at the airport and was surprised to see how beautiful the lights looked from the air. Heading into the valley, he passed over Lightning Buck Lake, which glowed like an oasis of flickering neon in the vast darkness. Then he looked up and saw that the sky was filled with millions of stars. He saw twinkling stars and shooting stars, white and blue and silver stars, bigger and brighter and more sparkling than they had ever looked from the ground. Ooh, how pleasant it is to fly at night, he thought. A few miles from Mountain View Airfield, J.J. saw something he will never forget. Just above the snow-capped mountain peaks, a silvery crescent moon hung in the sky like an enormous smile. As he began his descent, J.J.'s smile was almost as big. On the ground in Mountain View, the airfield manager talked to J.J. as the spare part was unloaded. Nice work, kid. We appreciate it, the manager said. Better head back straight away. Big fog's rolling in. They say it's going to be thicker than bee soup out there. As J.J. returned across the valley, he was once again captivated by the beauty of the night sky. The moon smiled an enchanting smile, and the stars winked and beckoned. He could not resist. Racing up to join the stars, he shouted with joy, I'm J.J., the night bird. <laughs> and with the grace of a ballet dancer, he soared and sailed and circled and glided in the glittering, glistening, glorious starlight. J.J. didn't know how much time had passed when he first noticed the soundless haze that had moved in all around him. Within moments, all of Terrytown Valley was covered by a dense fog, and it was getting thicker by the second. J.J. could no longer see the stars or the moon or the mountains or anything at all, except the fog, and he became hopelessly lost. The hour was getting late, the fog was getting worse, and back at Terrytown Airport, Easy O'Malley, Big Jake, and Herky were very worried about J.J. He should have been home by now. They say he left Mountain View almost two hours ago, said Easy O'Malley. Big Jake looked grim. I'd better go find him, he said, gazing out toward the valley. Easy O'Malley wouldn't hear of it. No way I'll let you fly in that suit, Jake. Let's face it, there's nothing we can do till the fog drifts. Well, yes, 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 there is, shouted Herbie. He shot straight up and hovered just long enough to announce, I don't know just what to do. I, I know just what to do. Uh, leave, leave, leave to me, guys. And with that, Herbie darted away and disappeared into the fog. Minutes later, Herbie hovered just above Lightning Bug Lake. Tens of thousands of brightly flickering lightning bugs reflected in the water. Herky tilted his rotors just so, then grabbed them as fast as he could. It created a powerful suction, and instantly thousands of lightning bugs were drawn into his hand. As Herky took off in search of JJ, he glowed with the intensity of a powerful laser beam. Trying to find his way out of the fog, JJ had been flying in circles for well over an hour. His fuel tank was almost empty, and he was about to give up hope. Then, way off in the distance, he saw a faint glow through the soupy mist. He didn't know what it was, but he knew his only hope was to reach it as soon as possible. As J.J. drew closer to the light, he saw Herky scanning the sky. In the next instant, Herky saw J.J. Flying toward each other in the hazy light, they were identical grins of happy relief. Then, without speaking a word, they turned and headed for home. Later that night, inside the hangar, J.J. told Big Jake all about his adventure. So, what did you learn? asked Big Jake. J.J. thought for a moment, then said, I learned that the night can be very beautiful, and that I don't have to be afraid of the dark as long as I'm careful. Tonight, though, I wasn't very careful when I didn't come straight home. J.J., you're a very bright little jet, said Big Jake, smiling proudly. J.J. smiled proudly, too. 
Thanks, Big Jake. That's nice of you to say. But you know, I'll never in a million years be as bright as Herky was tonight. <laughs> day of the year, the annual Easy Airlines Air Show. The airport was all decked out for the occasion, with balloons and ribbons and banners and bows attached to everything in sight. All the planes were excited, and why not? This was their day to show off their special talents. Inside the hangar, the mood was not so upbeat. Old Oscar was ailing. Heavy black drops of oil dripped from his nose. His gears made loud, grinding noises. And worst of all, his rudder was out of whack. It went left when he tried to flip it right. And it went right when he tried to flip it left. Brenda Blue, the airline's ace mechanic, had worked on him all morning long. Oscar, you're a mess. I can't let you fly today. I'm sorry, but I just can't. Powder dash, growled old Oscar. I've never missed an air show, and I don't aim to miss this one. From high up in the control tower, Easy O'Malley announced the start of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, his voice boomed over the loudspeakers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our official greeter, Snuffy the Skywriter. Right on cue, Snuffy went into his act. Directly over the airfield in the clear blue sky, he wrote the word welcome and then framed it so that it looked like a large, beautiful welcome mat. It was a magnificent work of art. As the crowd cheered, Easy O'Malley announced the next act. Please welcome that hurrying, scurrying whirly bird, our very own Herky the Helicopter. Herky shot straight up from the ground, hovered a split second, then sped away in a zany, boiling dervish. Up and down, up and down, to and fro, stop and go, in and out and all around, right side up and upside down, Herky rippled, spiraled, tumbled and rolled. Finally, as if attached to a rubber band, he coiled round and round the control tower until he reached the end of his imaginary tether, then flung himself back like a slingshot missile, landing neatly atop the hangar. Tracy blinked her eyes in disbelief. Hey, JJ, she said, did you just see what I think I saw? Meanwhile, inside the hangar, old Oscar was still out of kilter, and Brenda Blue was still hard at work trying to fix him up. Don't give up now, Brenda. I sure haven't, the feisty old plane said. I know you can do it, and I know I can do it, by golly. Back at the show, Tracy was about to finish her act. She raced in a wide circle, picked up speed, then, like a precision pinwheel, went spinning across the sky, turning perfect cartwheels over and over and over. She ended her act with an elegant sweep over the cheering grandstand. Next, Easy O'Malley announced Big Jake and JJ. This will be a daredevil stunt never before attended anywhere on Earth. When Big Jake took off with JJ riding piggyback, a gasp, then a hush, fell across the crowd. JJ held on tightly as the mighty Jake climbed up and up and up and up and up. JJ had never been so high, and still Big Jake climbed higher and higher and higher. Finally reaching the top of his awesome climb, Big Jake paused, executed a perfect swan dive, then on the way down went into an amazing double figure eight. On the last upswing, JJ peeled off Big Jake's back with an upside down loop to the right, just as Big Jake did a forward loop to the left. The two planes curled around and came in for a spectacular simultaneous landing. Facing each other, they came to an abrupt stop only inches apart. The crowd cheered and cheered and cheered. Herky was so excited he bounced around like a brand new rubber ball. Inside the hangar, old Oscar grinned like a cat with a mouse as his engine sputtered to life. 
Chicka pop, chicka pop, chicka pop, the engine gasped. What do you do? The ancient plane shouted gleefully. Nothing to it, hey, Brenda. <laughs> Oscar, don't forget your rudder problem. Remember left is right and right is left. Rudder, rudder. Hello, Molly, to announce me. And Rick. It's time for a real treat, folks. For the first time since last year's show, old Oscar, the biplane, will take to the sky. Chicka pop, chicka pop, chicka pop. All eyes turned toward the hangar as old Oscar sputtered into the daylight. Chicka boom, chicka boom, chicka boom. The rickety old plane grabbed his engine as he lurched down the runway. Then, like a dizzy swimming dolphin, he rose from the ground in a stuttering, staggering, humpbacked climb. He planned to fly a wide, majestic curve over the grandstand, then come in for a smooth, dignified landing. But as he tried to turn, he realized something was wrong. It was his rudder. In a panic, he flipped it left, and then right, then left, then right, trying to remember what Brenda Blue had told him. All of a sudden, he flipped himself into a spectacular diving barrel roll. He shot straight down like a spinning corkscrew, twisting ever more rapidly as he fell. Old Oscar saw the ground racing toward his face. He didn't like the look of things, so he closed his eyes. At the same instant, thousands of spectators gasped and held their breath. Pull up! Pull up! Screamed JJ. Somehow, that's just what old Oscar did. Seconds before crashing, he pulled up. Not only that, he made it look easy, landing with the grace of an eagle right in the middle of the airfield. rushed out to see if the old-timer was okay. <laughs> Boy, whooped old Oscar with a boyish grin. That's the most fun I've had in years. Wow, Oscar, I didn't know you could dive like that, said J.J., brimming with admiration. Well, son, <laughs> right there's a good example of what determination can do for you. If you believe in yourself and never give up, there's no limit to what you can accomplish. <laughs> but, uh, look here. Don't ask me to do that dive again anytime soon. <laughs>